Welcome back to Intro Linguistics. Today we'll talk about features in phonology. I'm going to make a note here. There's a ton of information in this video. There's no way you can learn it and remember it all in one take. If you have a textbook or class notes, uh, please use this as a supplementary video to help you explain and maybe give you tips about identifying features because there is a ton of information and I put the bare bones on these slides to help you guys out. So, first part, what are features? Well, we have sounds and we have sound properties, so we should describe the sounds using those properties. So for instance, this P here is a consonant. It is not sonorant. It is not syllabic. It is not nasalized. It is not a continuant. It's not voiced. Um, it's made, it's a bilabial sound, so we'll put it in the labial section, and your lips are not rounded. So these are some properties of P. I did not list them all. I listed a lot of unnecessary ones, but essentially the idea here is that you can describe sounds in terms of their properties. A plus means that they have them, and a minus means that they don't. So sometimes it's important to put them all down and not just leave them blank if it's a minus in order to make a distinction between sounds. Why do you need to do that? Well, we'll discuss that shortly. So the purpose of features. We want to talk about how these features interact. How do these sounds interact with each other in other environments? And two, we want to create these natural classes. So a natural class is where we have a bunch of sounds and there's only one feature that distinguishes them from their other counterparts. So for instance, if we take a look at coronal uh, sounds, which are sounds made in the alveolar region or the alveopalatal and the palatal region of your mouth, um, we have to, du, and n, which are all minus continuant, meaning there's no continuous airflow, while all these other sounds have continuous airflow. And that's the only difference between these groups of sounds is the continuant. So for instance, why do we need to separate these? Well, we may have some processes, like maybe some vowels, that, occur, that appear differently before non-continuant, uh, or say non-fricatives. So sounds that are not continuous may have one environment for vowels, and sounds that are continuous may have a different environment for vowels. So we need to be able to separate them in order to make rules and in order to talk about how these sounds interact with each other. So let's talk about some major class features. So the class features distinguish sounds between obstruents, uh, nasals, glides, liquids, and vowels. So these separate the different classes in the sonority hierarchy. So if it's plus consonantal, that means there's an obstruction in the vocal tract, not the larynx. Um, so for instance, uh, vowels, there's no obstruction, so they're minus consonantal. While plosives like p and t, there's an obstruction in the vocal tract. So if you make a t, you're blocking airflow with your um, alveolar ridge um, with sh. You are letting air through, but you are obstructing the way the air comes out. So that is plus consonantal. The syllabic feature um, basically, if it can be a nucleus, then it's going to be plus syllabic. If it's not a nucleus, it's going to be minus syllabic. So for instance, p, t, k, sh cannot be nucleuses, so they're going to be minus syllabic. But vowels and glides, well, they can be nuclei, so they'll be plus syllabic. And the last property is sonorant, or sonorant. Uh, these are singable sounds. Um, it's not a very good term, it's the easiest one I could relate, uh, so what I'll do is I'll move on to the next slide and I'll hopefully explain it better there. So a sonorant um, is anything that can really be hummed or uh, said, repeat. I wouldn't say repeatedly, it can be kind of drawn out. So you could say you can't really sing, you can't really go like It's just it's just air coming out. But mm, 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 that is more singable, also terribly off tune. Um, so you can do this with liquids, glides, vowels. Um, it's kind of rough. Just remember that only obstruents are not sonorant. Uh, so let's take a look at this class chart here a little bit more in depth. 
First of all, obstruents are just consonantal. They're not syllabic, they're not sonorant. Nasals and liquids, however, they are not syllabic, but they are sonorant. So, m mm, mm, mm can't be nuclei, and l and r cannot be nuclei either. However, they're both consonants, and they're both sonorant. What about glides? Well, those aren't consonants, those are semi-vowels. They're not syllabic, but they are sonorant. So, hi and w, not syllables, not consonants, but they're definitely sonorant. And vowels, uh, of course, they're syllabic. They are the nuclei of syllables, so uh, they're not going to be consonantal, because they're not consonants, they're vowels, and they're going to be sonorant, because they're above nasals. Okay, so this is the chart I'd have you memorize. Memorize these, understand these. This is the most important one for making class judgments. Second set of features is the manner features. So continuant, nasal, delayed release, and lateral. Um, each of these shape how air flows. So continuant is continuous airflow. So s, sh, Th, um, m, l, r. We all have this continuing airflow with these sounds. So this is basically uh, what I like to say. I'll use a different color. Um, not plosives or not stops. That's basically what continuant is. Um, also sounds like ch. That's not a continuant. Um, j, not a continuant. But sh is, and so is j. Uh, nasal's a little bit more clear. If it's plus nasal, that means it goes through the nose. So sounds are like mm, mm, and mm. Delayed release. Uh, there's two in English that are plus delayed release. You'll also see this as dr sometimes. Um, and this are ch and j. So the tongue goes up to the top to stop airflow like ch. So we get that release for the t, but then immediately after we have this sh that follows along. So it's a very slow release, it's a delayed release. Uh, and again, j is just the voiced counterpart. Uh, the last one is lateral. So air flows on the side of the tongue. The only sound in English we have is l. So you can kind of feel your tongue um, stops air in the center. It folds up the sides a little bit and air flows out those sides. So that is the l sound. So those are manner features. Again, when do you put a minus on it? When do we say minus continuant, minus nasal, minus delayed release? You put those there when you need to distinguish between two sets of sounds. So remember when I said about natural classes, how we distinguish between the non-continuant and the plus continuant sounds? If we need to just isolate the T, D, and the N, then we say minus continuant to specify those sounds because the rest are plus continuant. So that's how we can distinguish between classes of sounds. So you use these features when you need to make a distinction. Now, of course, this comes with practice and exercises. Hopefully we'll get some of those in this video. Um, that's why I recommend this as supplementary notes and not as the 100% all I need to learn features. Okay, so manner features are done. Next are laryngeal features. First one is voice. You know what voice is? Does it sound voiced? Vowels, glides, nasals, d, g, b, those are voiced. So we put plus voice. Everything that's not voiced is minus voice. Okay, simple. Second one, spread glottis. Now, when we do aspirated sounds and get a puff of air directly from the throat, those are plus spread glottis, which is also plus sg, or plus or minus sg. So, in English, Aspirated sounds and huh, those are spread. Closed glottis. Uh, the only thing in English is the glottal stop, and the closed glottis basically means no air is coming out of the glottis. So that is the uh huh, that sound in the middle there that you can't hear. So that is opt in CG. So if you ever want to just specify this sound here, then in the feature chart, you just write plus CG. And that would basically say, oh, we're talking about this sound in English. Because that's really the only sound that is plus closed glottis. So, those are the laryngeal features. 
Next are the place of articulation. So here we have different sections. So for instance, labial sounds, we would just write LAB in the feature matrix. And then we would write something about its roundness. So labial is the lips, so lips can be rounded. If the lips are rounded, we say it's plus round. If not, it's minus round. But this feature is tied to labial. If the sound is not labial, we do not talk about the roundness of the lips. Next, coronal. This is the alveolar ridge, um, the palatal area. So that encompasses t, d, sh, z, and sounds in between. So first we'll talk about anterior sounds. Again, anterior is a coronal only or coronal only. Um, so if it's in front of the palate, it's anterior. So plus ant would be something like t or d or n, while minus anterior would be something like sh or z. So is it in front of the palate? If the answer is yes, it's plus. If not, it's minus. Uh, the next one is plus or minus strident. These are the noisy fricatives. So sh, s, z, z. So those kind of things. Um, I can't make noise with th or th. It doesn't have that same um, pain or the, that, that same vibrance that sh has, where it's really loud. Sh is really audible. So if it's really audible, it's going to be plus strident. So if we want to just talk about s and sh and z and z, plus strident is the feature we want to use. Okay, one more is the dorsal. So this is the back of the tongue. This is your velars um, and your uvular sounds, which we don't have in English. Uh, so we use the plus high for velars, palatals, and vowels. So all of these features apply to vowels. So we use these all with vowels, but we also use these with velars and uvulars and palatal sounds. So if it's high, that means the tongue gets pushed towards the roof of the mouth. So like k and n, the tongue moves back and up towards the roof of the mouth. So this is harder to feel, so this is the kind of ones you want to memorize. So the k and the g, your tongue moves high. Low is the opposite, so in English you just need to worry about the vowels because we don't have any consonants that are plus low in English. Um, plus or minus back is the tongue behind the palatal region. So again, this k and n are in the back, also used for vowels. Uh, plus or minus tense is just used for vowels as well. And then we have this plus or minus reduced. Now in English, the reduced just means schwa. So that's when you take the vowel and you reduce it to a schwa. So when it's unstressed, it is plus reduced. So if we want to say, um, hey, we want this rule where things go to a schwa, we just say, okay, we just add this reduced feature to it in this scenario and it becomes a schwa. So that's the dorsal. Those are all place of articulation features. So really, those are all the features we need. Now that was a lot of information to take in and I'm not going to go back and forth between the slides for this question. So hopefully you have a feature chart with you or are at least listening and you can follow along and then try back later. So when we separate into natural classes, there's usually one feature that'll separate a group of sounds from another. Here we're just going to do it with pairs of sounds. So we take two sounds and we say what feature is different between them. So th and th. The difference here is voicing. So this is the plus or minus voice is the difference between th and th. What about p and f? Well, one is a stop, and one is a fricative, so it must be a continuant. So the airflow is different between the two. What about b and m? Well, b and m, they're both made in the same place, they're both voiced, uh, but one is a nasal and one is not. So the difference must be plus or minus nasal. What about s and f? Well, s and th, they're both coronal sounds, 
but one is noisy and one is not. So this must be plus or minus strident. And I know when you're first looking at these, some of these features may not come to mind immediately. Um, the difference between me and you, who's just learning this for the first time, um, this may seem very daunting to you at first. How do I do this so quick? I feel bad, I can't do it. Some of you may be saying, oh, this is fine, this is easy. Um, the difference is experience. I've done a lot of practice sets. I've, lot of done a, I've done a lot of work with these things. I've explained them quite a few times. So when I see these sound pairs, I can immediately tell you what the feature is that, different, that is different between the two. Um, this will come with practice, so do all the problems you can in your textbook. Um, play around with sounds. Uh, take a look at natural classes. Try to separate sounds. Take a group of sounds in different languages and see if you can separate them. So that'll come with practice. Uh, so again, find some sound pairs. Test these out. Look at the previous features. Pause the video. Go back. Take a look at them um, and try your best. So now that that's done, let me tell you, you can find these feature charts online. Some of them may have different feature names. Uh, you may need to look them up. I'm using the most commonly one. Uh, you may see stuff like ATR. You may see plus or minus lax, but there's no point in having plus or minus lax if you have plus or minus tense. Um, so there may be some differences there. Uh, the key ones, you don't need to remember everything. That's ridiculous. Memorizing, taking a look at a sound and memorizing the list of features is ridiculous. What you should do is you should memorize at least try to understand and memorize the differences between groups of sounds. So what are the strident sounds? What are the continuant sounds? And then put those together later. Make groups of sounds that are continuant, that are strident, that are nasal, that are delayed release, and then put them together afterwards so you can reconstruct their features. Don't try to memorize what, what a sound has for each of its feature. Don't say, okay, s uh, what is the consonantal? What is the continuant? Don't do it like that because it's going to be very difficult and it's very overwhelming. Second tip, practicing sounds is going to be great. You'll learn the features. But the most important part is that the important features of a sound and the important group of sounds, uh, this depends on the problem you're working with. So some problems, you're not going to need to worry about striding. You're not going to have to worry about that at all. Delayed release won't be an issue. You might just be focusing on nasals. You might just be focusing on the place of articulation and one other property. So the important features you need to look at and understand will vary depending on the problem. That's why you need to focus on natural classes. So when you have a natural class and you can see two different natural classes, you can probably tell what the problem is asking because you can already see the natural classes. So. When doing exams, don't worry about individual sounds and all their features. Look at groups of sounds at a whole and figure out if you can see what's happening in these different environments. Um, is there one key feature that is looked at in all these different environments? Maybe that's the one you need to focus on. So again, practice. Do problems in your own textbook. Um, this video would be too long if I tried to fit in more problems, so I may make a practice video with some problems, but um, I'm not entirely sure about that yet. So this video was tough. Don't feel bad if you didn't get everything the first time. Try your best. This is the hardest part of introduction to linguistics by far. Definitely the hardest part that any linguistic students will encounter is phonological features. Definitely. Okay, so that was features. Next time, talk about rules. You do need to know features to do the rules. Um, However, I still think it's good, even if you don't know all the features, to watch the video and try to understand what's going on, because rules are also hard. They are the first introduction to, I'd say, something very close to math in linguistics. Um, they're just rules, but people find them challenging because it's a very different way of thinking. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below, and I hope to see you in the next video.